you would take your Bibles and go to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19, and then uh, I want you to turn back to, to Titus chapter 2. So go to Revelation 19, and then go back to Titus 2. Health related. I thought that last week. It's all good. Um, uh, 
we have to pay attention to the Word of God. We have to be rooted in the Word of God. Uh, this book right here, I, I used to, I'm not going to grow up hearing it all. This book will keep you sin from sin or sin will keep you from this book. Oh, 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 oh. I'm not mocking. I'm just saying I've heard it all. You can hear it all. But if you don't read it all yourself, you, you'll be like the chap that blows away all of You've got to get, you have to get a hold of God and say, God, you got to do something in my heart. You got to do something in my life. You got to, you got to, you got to. You said we're more than conquerors. You said we're more than oh, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Well, where's that at? As I was driving in this morning, I, it dawned on me. I didn't sing a song all day long. I didn't whistle. I didn't hum. I didn't put it on in the car and play it like we usually do on our way to school or church. And you say, oh, well, is that the antidote? No, but it's a, it's a, it's a great medicine. It's a great medicine. And I turned on this church down in Kentucky. They are not all polished and printed. And that's, that's nothing wrong with polished and printed. They're just from Kentucky, and it sounds like they're from Kentucky. But I'll tell you right now, they belled it out Ooh, and immediately lifted my soul. They sang two songs called He's Still on the Throne. How many of y'all know that song? He's Still on the Throne. Well, what could be wrong? He's Still on the Throne. And the other one is, as he stood the test of time. And if you want to talk about wanting to get out of the car and have a, a, a charismatic holy connection fit on the side of the road, I wanted to have it. I wanted to have it because it dawned on me. The devil can press on me and the world can press on me and problems and burdens can press on me and they can suppress my my uh, my uh, well-being, my physical body can be tired, my emotional st uh, uh, st stability can be uh, uh, fractured, but man oh man, you know what they can't get? They can't get your spirit if you don't let them. The devil can't get your spirit if you don't let them and I don't want them to have my spirit. Yeah, you can't have my spirit. You're not going to win. And then just something flipped inside of me on my way this morning that made me grip my teeth and clench my fist and stomp my foot and say, hey, you devil, you can't have me. You can't have me and you're not going to win. Now, what keeps, what, what helps a Christian keep going? I'll tell you this right now, and I, I said it just briefly yesterday in our soul winning meeting. The thing that helps a Christian keep going is knowing what you can know about heaven. Yeah. What you can know about heaven. Now, uh, Revelation 19 isn't a chapter that I read and go, oh, how wonderful. I read it and go, whoa. Now let's let's read Revelation 19. Let's start in verse 11. Look at verse 11. Or, uh, yeah. I'm in Titus over here. Let's flip back. All right. Verse number 11. The Bible says, uh, and I saw, this is John speaking, and I saw heaven open to behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he would smite, he should smite the nations. Uh, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treaded the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, To all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet and wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with fire and brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now, uh, before jumping into what all that means, I'm not this morning I'm not trying to dissect what all that is. But that is an end time prophecy that is about our Savior Jesus Christ coming back to erase 
the enemies of, 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 uh, of heaven, and uh, uh, all who uh, said uh, no to his Holy Spirit for salvation. This is um, end time tribulation stuff. This is where Jesus Christ comes back to uh, uh, eradicate the enemies and sit on the throne in Jerusalem. Now, over in Titus, chapter 2, verse number 11, the Bible says, For the grace of God hath bring, uh, uh, hath that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Uh, this is Paul's letter to Titus. He's telling Titus, look, preach this stuff. Don't shy away from it. Preach it. Let it be known that Jesus Christ is coming back. And since Jesus Christ is coming back, we ought to live uh, 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 in such a way that we shun ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in, in where? In, in heaven? Ah, it's a given. In this present world. Now, I'm, we're living in a time where it's becoming more and more difficult to do that. Lust is everywhere. Lust is everywhere. Deception is everywhere. Uh, 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 covetousness is everywhere. And it, it, it's pervasive. It's, it's everywhere. And it's getting our children. It's in our politics. It's in our homes. And it's in our churches. Live soberly. Live soberly. Righteously. Now, back last October, um, or October 7th, there was a, an attack in Israel, and, and they're still at war, by the way. Still people dying, and uh, missiles being uh, fired, and the Iron Dome still being operated, and the, every, every country has given its opinion. Uh, many churches have preached uh, kind of what the Bible says about Israel, and standing blessed is the nation that uh, uh, stands with Israel. Um, I will bless them that bless them, the Bible says. And, and we do that. We, we as a church, I as a person, I stand with Israel, not because they're perfect, not because they're better, but because it's, it's God's chosen land, it's God's chosen people to bring forth his prophecy. Well, uh, uh, we kind of get away from that. The end times. You know, big bad things happen. It catches our attention for a while. And then, all right, well, the bills still need paid. Things still need to happen. The gas in the car still needs to build up. The tire still needs changed. change. Mom still needs visited in the hospital. Dad still needs to take his medic medication. Kids need to still get off of school. And we forget about end times. We forget about Jesus Christ is coming back. Jesus Christ is coming back. And in, in, in Acts where they, uh, uh, they stood up and saw Jesus going into heaven on a cloud and two men in white apparel stood by and said, what, what, what are you guys gazing at? What are you looking up in the skies for? He's going to come back just like he left. So get busy. Live righteously. Live soberly. Avoid this, this, uh, this worldly type of lifestyle. I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus Christ is going to come back. He is. Whether it be in our lifetime or not, he's coming back. He is going to come back. And the thing is, is what will you be found doing? Jesus gave parables about, um, about a certain master or um, a man who had um, a servants, stewards. And he said, I am leaving. I'll come back at the appointed time. And here are your responsibilities. Here are your responsibilities. And he gave three stewards. He gave the, 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 to one steward, he gave five talents. Another, he gave two. Another, he gave one. And the one that had five went out and doubled what he, his master had given him. He brought forth fruit into the household of his master. The guy that had two went out and did what the guy that had five had. And then the guy that had one took it and buried it and said, well, I don't want to lose it. I don't want to lose it, so I'm just going to make sure I have it for him when he comes back. The Bible says, through much is given, much is required. Much is expected. Man, I've been given the gospel. I might want to do something with it. I've been given American citizenship. I might want to do something with it. I've been given a what we would call a nuclear home. I grew up with mom and dad both there. 
Dad was the breadwinner and mom made home home. I grew up in church. I grew up with a, a, a great support system. I grew up with all the kind of, I, got, I grew up with people rooting for me. I grew up with people saying, Jake, you can be something. Jake, you can be somebody. Jake, you can. And if I do nothing with it, I'm like the guy that had one from his master who took it and buried it and said, well, you know, I knew that you were a hard master. No, then you didn't know your master because the master that Jesus spoke about is God the Father who's loving and kind and patient and long-suffering and merciful. The guy that buried the talent didn't know Lamentations chapter 3. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies are new every morning. His compassions, they fail not. That's our Father. But, the, but Jesus gave this parable and said, I, the master's coming back. What will we have given? What will we have done? Now, if we look at the, the world through, through the scope of prophecy, the Bible says, listen, have there always been floods? Yes. Have there always been earthquakes? Yes. Tornadoes? Yes. Volcanic eruptions? Yes. Hurricanes? Yep. Yep. The world says they're happening more often because of uh, uh, global warming. No, they're happening more often because the Bible said they were. Right. right. The Bible said these things will, there'll be an uptick in them. I-40 in Tennessee, half of it's washed out. Anybody see that? Just washed out. I think I think the last time I read about Hurricane, what is it? Is it uh, Hurricane Helene? Helene, uh, uh, over 100 people are dead already. Truck drivers stuck in their trucks with water just pouring in on them. I mean, people are dying right now. People are stranded right now. It's terrible. It's terrible. The world is having incredibly, uh, is incredibly just decaying and falling apart around us. Why? Because of because somebody sprayed too much hairspray in the 80s? Because because uh, because lazy people throw trash on the side of the road. By the way, don't litter. Right. Uh, I, don't litter. Clean up after yourselves. Uh, but um, uh, what, what? It's anything and everything besides God's word. That's all it is. It's anything and everything besides God's word. It's every reason besides God's word. Every cause besides God's word. It's just rejection of it. It's rejection. The world has adopted science as their tool against God when my God is the one who created all things that consist of science. Amen. That's my God. My God. We, we, we operate in a three-dimensional world, right? Time, space, and matter. Time, space, and matter. Well, my God made time, space, and matter. Amen. My God out, operates outside of that structure. Right. So when the Bible says that these things happen more often, more often, more often, uh, Peter, he says, be not, be not ignorant of this one thing. And he says, that, that a day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. But in that same chapter, he says, in the last days, there are going to be scoffers. Scoffers. You just go ahead and take a day to scour social media and the internet. It won't take you long to find people who are, doing, are saying some of the most blasphemous things against our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Against our Creator, God. People laughing, scoffing, making fun of Jesus returning. He's going to come back. He's going to come back. Paul said it, he's dead. Come on. These guys said it, they're all dead. That's right. It's just my turn to say it. Our turn to say it. Amen. Are we saying it? Are we sharing it with our family? Are we sharing it with our friends? Are we sharing it with people we know who... You can't help but have a conversation about politics and, and, and um, uh, 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 the, uh, the riots and things. And by the way, it's not, it's not it's just America. Like, the world is on fire True. from natural disasters and from ideology. It's on fire politically and, 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 and from nature. What, what do we think is, is happening? I'll tell you what's happening. The world is getting ready for Jesus. Amen. The world is getting ready for Jesus. Now you could say, well, no, it's getting ready for the Antichrist. It's getting ready. It's getting ready. And now this isn't a doom and gloom message today. This isn't a, everybody, let's go sell all our stuff and sit in the middle of the field and wait for Jesus to come back. No. Paul gave Titus what to do. Paul said, 
Jesus is coming back. The grace of God bringing salvation. It has appeared to all men. Teaching us. Teaching us what? That denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. This present world. If it means the present world, then that must mean there's a future world to come. And that future world is going to be owned, operated, reigned by Jesus Christ himself. Amen. Jesus Christ. Now, are we living... Are we living with this admonition? Are we living with this charge as Paul gave to Titus? Are, we can adopt that as our own. We can adopt it as our own. Now I jump over my, the rest of my introduction here. It's all good, man. It's all good. But the Bible says, looking for the blessed hope. Looking for the blessed hope. Folks, everywhere I look around me, man, I... Miss Jessie, she's going to help me put these these screens to a better use. Uh, there's something about our culture now where visual aids are a great help. Good. They're a great help. Right. But I've been I've been looking into specifically the sorrow of mankind. The sorrow of mankind. I came across something the other day um, where people were sharing their stories about how they were. Um, Physically, emotionally, sexually abused. Mm. Who those who would abuse drugs? Mm. Those who you could. I'm telling you, you can look into people's eyes, and folks, you can see there is unmentionable, yes, sir. unspeakable, yes. unfathomable sorrow mm. in this world. Yes, sir. We. Uh, I missed. Uh, quick exit in Chicago going back to Midway. So I hopped on 53A and got back on and, and had 55 South towards St. Louis. Uh, and as soon as we got into the viaduct, it was, it was a mini skid row. Everywhere. People living in tents. Everywhere. And, and let's, let's, let's be cynical for a moment. They deserve to be there. No. They deserve it. Their bad decisions led them there. Their bad decisions led them there. That's not always the case. That's like saying all of these people are that and all of these people are that. That's so prejudiced. Right. That's so foolish. That's so, that's so wicked. That's sinful to lump all people into one group. Them homeless people. I used to boo-hoo my eyes out when I was old Lincoln's age, nine years old. I, couldn't, it, I could not wrap my mind around the thought of somebody living in a box in an alley. I couldn't wrap my mind around somebody eating food out of a dumpster. It broke my heart. And then I grew up and realized it's their own fault. That's what the world does to us. The world, the flesh, and the devil wants to give you a heart of indifference. Give you a heart of justice served. Last I checked, I'm not the judge. Last I checked, I'm not even on the jury. I'm, in, I'm, the, pl I'm, the, I'm the one being convicted. I want mercy. Man, I want mercy. God says, if you want mercy, extend it. Now, I can't give money to every panhandler. I can't rescue every homeless person. I can't, I can't help everybody. But I do know the one who can. And if we aren't looking for the blessed hope, we can't possibly extend the blessed hope. If I'm not looking for the return of my Savior, I can't possibly share it with somebody. I can't possibly give it to somebody. If I'm so tied up politically, and if I think Donald Trump's the blessed hope, we're wrong. Amen. Jesus is the blessed hope. Amen. And if you think Kamala Harris is the blessed hope, you're wrong. Jesus is the blessed hope. And if you think any other president or any other future president is the blessed hope, we're wrong. But the Antichrist is going to come along, and he's going to be the blessed hope that a bunch of people put their faith in. We're not looking for that. We're looking for Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the one who shed his blood for me. I'll tell you this right now. If there are nail scars in the hands and in the feet and in the side and on the brow, he's not my Savior. He's not my Savior. Now the Bible says, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, 
Hallelujah. No more fighting, no more bloodshed, no more destitution, no more poverty, no more prostitution, no more, no more ugliness, no more hatred, no more graveyards, no more iniquity, no more transgression, no more sin, no more pain, no more tears. That's the Jesus who's going to rescue me. Iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. The Bible says Jesus went about doing good. Paul says to Timothy here, make sure you're zealous about going about doing good works. Doing good works. Somebody um, uh, uh, came to me last week and said, Brother Jackson, this is a concern of mine, and it's not a big deal, but it's a concern of mine. And I said, well, the right thing, the good thing, would be to make sure we get a swear. I had somebody call me at 3, 3.30 this morning. <coughs> call me. And say, Brother Jackson, my life's falling apart. I don't even know what I'm doing. You know what the flesh wanted to do at 3.30? Man, don't call me at 3.30. I was dreaming. You know, I was, I was dreaming I was preaching a good sermon for once. I, I, what do I do? And I told him, man, don't worry about it. And he said, I'm sorry to bother you. I said, man, don't worry, don't, don't worry about bothering me. This is, this is giving me an opportunity to do good works. Man, when you, we have an opportunity to do good works, it's a Christ-likeness. And Paul said to Titus, zealous unto good works. And if you know where Titus was serving, he was like, dude, I don't want to be here. Titus, it's good for you to stay in Crete. Crete was full. Slow he said, See, he said slow bellies. Liar. These were a bunch of lying, cheating, thieving, slow belly people. I can't get these people to get up to, to <laughs> you know, I can't get them to walk down the buffet line. Sunday lunch. I got to feed it all to them. And Paul said, it's good for you to stay there. Yeah. Titus, you do good works. You do good works. You may be the only one in your family trying to do good works. Don't you stop trying to do it. Don't you stop trying to do it. You may be the only one in your family serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't let those who don't discourage you from doing so. I heard a, a, a pastor share some things this past week about uh, how some folks had turned on him and he wasn't he did not uh, he didn't utter a slander against him he didn't uh, he was just sharing his heart and immediately it was a gun a gut punch like oh man are you kidding me but then it was more of a like I said clench my teeth and clench my fist and stomp my foot and say not me not me. The devil ain't going to get me. You say, why? Because you're tough? No. No, because I don't, I'm not fighting to fight myself. I'm going to let him do it. Why? Because I've set my affections on things above and not on things on the earth. And I'm trying to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And let all, let all the things be added unto me. Like Pastor said a little while ago. God, God doesn't want to take your money. He wants to give you money. God doesn't want to take your joy. He wants to give you joy. He doesn't want to take your peace. He wants to give you peace. He doesn't want to take your strength. He wants to give you strength. He doesn't want to take your victory. He wants to get victory through you. That's what he wants to do. We think that God wants to take something from us. It is. It's usually selfishness and give us Christ-likeness to do something for his kingdom and his glory. But folks, when was the last time on your own that you meditated, you thought about Christ's coming? When's the last time you thought about Jesus coming again? If you're like most people, it's been too long. If you're like most Christians, it's been too long. People, we are more, uh, we, we are more prone to be practical than we are mystical. We're more realistic than we are idealistic, I think. What's in the here and now, the here and now, the here and now? I can see it, I can taste it, I can feel it, I can, I can you know, uh, uh, smell it. What we tend to do at, um, at uh, uh, funerals, really, we tend to, to have a moment, have a day of thinking in the future at funerals uh, and near-death experiences than we do on Sundays, than we do on Mondays when we wake and go, today could be that day of blessed hope. Today, folks, I don't know if you get this or not, but today could be the day that we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. It could be today. Like, I get it. Like, we're all, we all have these things that we're worried about and that we're concerned. We're going to leave and go live life. There's no, it's not, I'm not condemning that. We have to do that. Yeah. But today could be the day of blessed hope. Tomorrow could be that day. So don't waste our time living ungodly. 
Don't waste our time in, uh, uh, in, 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 in idolatry and in, in lust and in, in theft and lies and cheating. Let's get right with God because today could be that day. You say, Brother Jackson, I haven't lived most of my life in righteousness. I haven't lived most of my life in sobriety. I, I haven't. And, and, and what's a day going to matter? What's two days going to matter? The same that mattered for the thief on the cross. Mm -hmm. The same that it mattered for the thief on the cross is the same that matters for you today. He was dying. He was crucified on the cross for being a probably habitual theft. Over and over and over, probably stole. He probably stole from the wrong guy. That's what he did. Yeah. Crucify him. He was being crucified. But his last day on this earth, you know what he did? He turned to Christ. He turned to Christ. Now maybe you sit here today and you've turned to Christ for salvation. You believed on him. You said, man, I, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I asked him to save you just like Josh Henley did in the backseat of the car on Thursday. Just like I did on February 4th, 2001. Maybe you've done that. Maybe you said, I do believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But I've wasted so much of my life trying to get mine and, 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 and get vengeance and do my thing and sow the seeds in the flesh and not the things that Paul told Titus. What's it going to matter now? Brother Jackson, I'm in, my, I'm in my late 60s or 70s or 80s. I can't turn to God now. Yes, you can. Amen. Yes, you can. Sure. Yes, you can. Come unto me, Jesus says. Come unto me. Nicodemus was a spiritual man and old in age. And Jesus said to him, he must be born again. Like you may, may not need to be born again, but you can have renewal again. Mm -hmm. You can have renewal again. And maybe start off just for that simple saying, looking for that blessed hope. Looking for that blessed hope. There's an intersection around the roundabout over uh, Pontiac and uh, Coliseum area by the car wash. That uh, uh, there's, a, there's an intersection where you come up just past the car wash heading this way. Uh, there's a stop sign for these folks. And they don't, a lot of times they don't stop. They blow right through it. Well, usually when I'm headed that way, my wife and Lucas and the babies are all in the back seat. You know what I do every time I get to that intersection? I slow down and I look. I slow down and I look. I'm looking for the danger. I'm looking for danger. Many times we go into a restaurant. We go somewhere. I want to see the seat's evident. I want a seat that's closest to the door so I can get out of it. Uh, I want a seat so I can see who's coming, who's leaving, what's the atmosphere like? What am I doing? I'm, I'm just being on alert. I'm being a dad. I'm being a father. I'm being who, who I am and make me who I am. Just scoping things out. Well, he says, in this present world, in this present world, man, folks, I'm looking for another world to come. Yes, sir. I'm looking for another one. Folks, aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of the sad stories? Aren't you tired of the, the abused being abused? Aren't you tired of the hurt hurting? Aren't you tired of the, the haters hating? Aren't you tired of the violence and the bloodshed? Aren't you tired of those who seem to be almost possessed with demons about how happy they are to do these abominable works that God says those are wicked and abominable? And yet they're everywhere. People smile and laugh about them. I saw an interview with a woman, with a man who was preaching on some, uh, at some college campus somewhere. And she talked about an abortion that she had with almost a giddy smile. She said, they pulled it from my body, limb from limb. I do not hate that woman. I feel sorry for them. Yeah, yeah. That's about as lost as you can get. Yeah. When you are happy to do something like that. Do we see what, what, we almost want to coin everything as political, political ideology. When it's political, nothing. Yeah. It's right and wrong, light and dark, God and the devil. Yeah. And the devil will use theology, he'll use political um, uh, uh, ideology, he'll use a color, he'll use uh, uh, what side of town you're from, he'll use money, he'll use anything and everything he can do to divide people. To make people hate each other. To get them to. We all think our biggest enemy is China, Russia, North, I don't know if anybody thinks North Korea is our biggest enemy. North Korea. It's not. It's the devil. Yes. Amen. And that's not, that's not, that's not religious speak. That's the truth. Right. And it will last, it will last 
as the devil being our uh, our enemy until Jesus Christ comes back as he did in Revelation 21 and said, you're done, dude. You're done. You rule no more. You're done. And you throw them into hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Everybody thinks, folks, get this right. Maybe we ought to start like some apologetics classes in, in church or something. A lot of people think that the devil runs hell. He doesn't. He's going to burn hotter than anybody and everybody else. The devil runs hell. No, he doesn't. There's no devil throne in hell. He's going there to be tortured. He's going there. To get, hell was made for the devil and his angels. Right. And God is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And once we've done that, we look for the blessed hope. Folks, you want to turn your outlook? You want to change your outlook on life? Start looking up. Start looking for that blessed hope. Start looking for that blessed hope. Our Bible is full and running over. Full and running over with promises and encouragements directly related to the Lord Jesus. And I look and I look and I look. Folks, it's not just into that. It's not just, it's not just a, a, a thought about, it's highlighted. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And in the New Testament, it's an incredibly obvious truth. You can't read very far into the Bible without falling over, stumbling over, no matter what book you choose, and in that New Testament alone even. That Jesus Christ is coming back. He's coming back. So critics have denied it. Cynics have laughed at it. Scholars ignore it. Liberal theologians have explained it away. We're, we're going to rethink it. Fanatics, has, have, fanatics have, uh, have made, caused many people just to shrug it off. As the Bible tells us, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. See, I, I can be zealous, as Paul said to Timothy, be zealous unto good works. But not in such a way that I turn people away from the gospel. I'm zealous unto good works. I'm zealous for Christ. But in such a way that that guy doesn't understand me. That lady doesn't understand me. And I want to win them to Christ. Am I going to win them to Christ by bashing them over the head with the Bible? No, I'm going to win them to Christ by living out the Bible. By living as Christ. People have tried to, to, to just dismiss it all together. And they say in 2 Peter, where is the promise of His coming? Where is the promise of His coming? Hey, Christian, where's the promise of Jesus' coming? Where is it? Where is it? He's not here. He's not coming. That's what they say. But I'll tell you that the return of Jesus is going to continue to be attacked. It's going to, be, it's going to continue to be ignored and denied. But folks, here it is. Here it stands. It's solid as it had ever been. It's, it's as solid as bedrock, and it's going to be fulfilled. And what it should do is, this, this portion of, uh, of Scripture here, it should offer us hope. It should offer us a, a, an encouragement, uh, especially in a time of despair and unbelief. Despair and unbelief. People say, okay, what do we do in the meantime? What do we do? Okay, so since we're waiting, what do we do? Well, first I'm going to give you very, uh, two, two quick things, and I'm going to give them to you in five minutes. Well, I'm going to give it to you in a five-minute span, not in five minutes. First, you need to understand what you don't do. What you don't do. Number one, you don't just sit around. You don't just sit around listening for a trumpet. You don't spend uh, each day staring up into the sky looking for a break in the clouds and going, wow, that cloud looks like Jesus. I wonder if that's him. Folks, you don't whip out your white robe and tie yourself a, uh, 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 whip out a white robe and tie it to yourself and tie yourself to giant helium balloons that are painted like clowns and angels and try to ascend yourself up into heaven. You don't do that either. The other thing you don't do is sell all your possessions and go sit in the field and say, Jesus is coming back on uh, September 30th at noon. You don't know that. You don't know that. Don't do that. But what you do is you get it together. You say, Brother Jackson, what do you mean, get it together? Uh, you live every day as if it's your last. That's hard to do, isn't it? And then we've all tried that before. We've heard a song before. We've heard a sermon before. Live every day like it's your last. And we're like, well, that's really hard to do because I have to go to work. So that's difficult because I have a dentist appointment today. Uh, I have a knee replacement today. Live every day as if it's your last day. Man, oh man, what a thought. What, what, what a goal to try to live life. Now, of course, you can temper that. You can bring that in and say, well, I know that I have to balance life, but I'm going to do the best I can in, in my daily living. You say, well, how do I do that? You live every day for his glory. 
So you get it together by living every day like it's your last day for his glory. What you also do is you do work diligently at everything you find yourself doing. Work diligently at your job and in your home at the, it, as if he's not coming for another hundred years. Work diligently. Work like you're doing it for Jesus himself. For his name's sake. You do, you do shake the salt out of every bit of life that you can. And you do sh let your light shine as far and as bright as you possibly can. I can't help it. And I hope that you get to a point. I know some of you are at that point. Man, you meet people at the store. You meet people here and there. And you can't help. I mean, it doesn't matter where the conversation goes. Jesus is coming in. Mm -hmm. Jesus is getting tied in somewhere. Uh, some fella came in this afternoon. He was a patient in a hospital that my mom was talking to. And he wanted to talk to me about something. And um, I told him, man, I got a Sunday school class and whatnot. And he said, he said I want to tell you something. You, you, the way your mother talks about you. I said, me? Good. Me? She said, good. yeah, she talks about how you preach and how you love Jesus and how you're trying to do your best. And I'm like, well, that's, that's a mom always trying to see the best in you. I said, I got a lot of improvement. And he said, well, your mama loves you. And she, she's proud of you. Cool. Wow. That's, that, that made me feel real good. Because I feel like I've come up way short. And, and I do. Please don't say, oh, Brother Jackson, you're perfect the way you are. Sure. At this time in my life, I am who I am. But I want to grow. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be more like somebody who, who may you look at me and say, that guy's letting his light shine. That guy's the salt of the earth. Every Christian ought to say, I want to be salt and light. I want to be salt and light. I want to be salt and light. And I tell you, the motivating factor behind everything that we ought to do ought to be because we're looking for the blessed hope. The blessed hope. The blessed hope. I hope no matter what happens, that God will give America more time so we can tell more people about Jesus. Amen. That's what I want. We do get it together. We do let our light shine. We remain balanced. We remain cheerful people. We have winsome personalities. We're stable, if you will, sober. And what we're doing is anticipating uh, Brother Dan or Miss Sarah. We go knock on primary church door, please, and let them know we'll be closing shortly. Anticipating his return each day. Other than that, folks, other than that, I don't know what else to tell you. What do we do? Deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Other than that, I don't know what to tell you to do besides read your Bible. Let's have more Bible studies. Let's talk about it systematically. Let's talk about it topically. Let's dissect it verse by verse. Let's make it the, the, the lead of our life. But I'll tell you this. Unless you're not ready to fly away with Jesus, you better get your ticket fast. If you're not ready to leave this world knowing I don't have a hope so salvation. I have one and a half thumbs. One and a half thumbs up. No so salvation. I'm not hoping I'm going to heaven. I know I'm going to heaven. Because of him and his promises. Not because of righteous works that I've done, but because of him. And if you don't know for sure that if you die today that you would go to heaven, get your ticket today. It's free. They're being given away. All you have to do is ask for it. Just like Josh Henley did in the back of the car when he said, Dear God in heaven, I know that I'm a sinner, and for my sin, I deserve to go to hell. But I don't want to go to hell. So right now, the best I know how, I'm trusting Jesus and only Jesus to take me to heaven when I die. You can do that. If a 16-year-old young man can do that, you can do that. Would everybody bow their head and close their eyes? Hey, maybe you haven't been looking up. Maybe you haven't been looking for that blessed hope. Maybe you've been looking to the next big thing in your life, and that's okay. That's okay. Maybe the next big thing is graduation or marriage or career change or, or whatever, but, and that's okay. But there's something that ought to foreshadow all of that, and that's looking for the blessed hope.